From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Faye Bainter, Louis Stone, and Jackie Cooper in White Banners. Lux presents Hollywood. You'll find more than drama in tonight's play. You'll find a triumphant answer to some of life's greatest problems. An answer presented by an unassuming woman who shows us how the road of defeat can lead to victory. Screened by Warner Brothers, our play stars Faye Bainter, Lewis Stone, and Jackie Cooper. Conway P. Coe, United States Commissioner of Patents, is tonight's special guest, and Lewis Silvers conducts our music. Just a word now before hearing from Mr. DeMille. In Hollywood, screen stars whose complexions are literally priceless use Lux Toilet Soap. Well, that can mean only one thing. No finer soap than Lux Toilet Soap can be bought at any price. Made of the best possible ingredients. Hard milled as the finest French soaps are. Gentle, delicately fragrant, smooth. Next time you open a fresh cake, notice how white it is, how smooth it is. Then, when you use it, notice how rich, how close textured its lather is. Here is Hollywood's favorite beauty soap. It's a care you need for your skin. And now, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. From the flagstaff of the Lux Radio Theater, white banners blow in the breeze tonight. The white banners of high courage and a stout heart, symbolizing a heroine named Hannah who was neither young nor beautiful, but who inspired strength and a love of life in all who knew her. Our play, originating from the unerring pen of Dr. Lloyd C. Douglas, who gave us magnificent obsession and green light, is a drama of plain people who might live in the house next door. The Hannah of our play is the same artist who created the part on the screen, Faye Bainter. For several years, Miss Bainter has been dividing her much-demanded time between Hollywood Studios, the New York stage, and a farm in the Hudson River Valley, with the farm coming out third best. Born in Los Angeles, she went far afield for the fame that awaited her on Broadway, but came home to Hollywood for such new laurels as the Academy Award for her performance in Jezebel. In White Banners, Louis Stone adds another great character to the crowded gallery he's brought to life in a career covering nearly 40 years which was interrupted when he went to France in 1917 and returned a major of cavalry. But for 39 years, Louis Stone has had few days when he wasn't acting the part of someone other than himself, someone like Judge Hardy, or tonight like Paul Ward in White Banners. Rounding out our trio of stars is Jackie Cooper, who's been in pictures for 12 of his 16 years. Still remembered for his performances in The Champ and Skippy, Jackie's one of the few stars who's grown up on the screen grown up into such roles as Peter Trimble, which he played in the picture and repeats tonight. Jackie intends to be a character actor rather than a hero. He thinks he'll last longer. A student in Beverly Hills High School, he's a pretty good football player and in great demand as a swing drummer. He's just finished Bright Victory at Universal Studio and goes to Paramount next week where he'll star in Booth Tarkington, 17. Our curtain's going up. And the Lux Radio Theater presents Faye Bainter, Louis Stone, and Jackie Cooper in White Banners. The little town of Middale in New England. It's February, 1922, and a bitter wind sweeps along the snow-covered streets. In the Ward household, a typical day's beginning. The baby has just spilled her milk. Sally is late for school. And Mr. Ward, a teacher at Middale Academy, has misplaced his time. Mrs. Ward, caught in a tangled web of kitchen chores, tries vainly to make Sally hurry. Sally, Sally, get up. I don't have to, Mother. It's Saturday. It isn't, Sally. Now hurry. Mother, you're wrong. Ask Father. Ask your father. He wouldn't know what day of the week it is with his head full of retorts, test tubes, and the great invention he's going to create. Oh, you remember that only night before last he came to the supper table with his hat on. Marsha? Marsha, where's my necktie? Now, Paul, Sally insists that today is Saturday. And Mother thinks it's Friday. Well, I'll settle this insane argument. Today is Friday, the 10th of January, Anno Domini, 1922. Now, get up, Sally. But, Daddy, I know it's Saturday. Well, wait a minute. Maybe she's right. Marsha, do we have fish for dinner last night? Yes. Well, we only have fish on Friday, so there you are. Well, perhaps you're right. 
But you were so sure about it, Paul. Well, after working three o'clock in the morning in my invention, Marcia, this one will surprise you. Yes, it'll probably end up in an explosion and blow us all to bits. <laughs> no, no. Oh. What, what, what was that? The baby. That's the second time this morning she's pulled things off the sink. But, Marcia, that was my invention. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul, but she's into everything. Well, being sorry won't put it together again. You might have kept my work out of her reach. And you might have left me some room on the sink. Well, it's the only place I have to work. Of course, I know you don't think much of my efforts to invent something that'll make us some money and get me out of my miserable job. Oh, that isn't fair, Paul. I do believe in you. But I can't help worrying when the money for Sally's shoes goes for, for glass tubing. And now this week, all the household accounts overdue, and we get a bill from the Ellis brothers. Forty dollars for a, a couple of nuts. Oh, what of it? You can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. Eggs? If we don't pay our bills, we won't have any eggs. Oh, look at this grocery bill. Why should I look at grocery bills? What's a paltry forty dollars when it may lead to forty thousand, forty million dollars? Think what that'll mean. No more teaching for me in a filthy little school. Trips to Europe and rare books and fine paintings. And you smothered in sables. When that day comes, we'll laugh at bills. We'll tear them to shreds and toss them to the four winds. Why, Paul, you've torn up the bill. <laughs> you can always get more bills. Oh, Paul, you're crazy. But you're sweet. Oh, Mother, hurry breakfast. It's Friday after all. Here's the paper. What, Friday? But the fish. Canned salmon. It was on special. Good Lord. Hurry, darling. Hurry. You'll be late. Late. I'm late right now. Where's my necktie? Where... Here, dear. Here. Now tie it on the way. Oh, goodbye, dear. I never saw it to fail any time, I think. Oh, dear. Sally, I could slap you. Now pick up that mess there and hand me the eggs. You know, Mother, you're not looking well. Did you see Dr. Thompson yesterday? Yes, dear. What did he say? Rest more. Sleep more. Fresh air, take a tonic, take a trip. Oh, Mother, I'm worried about you. So is Daddy. <sighs> Why? Oh, you're getting so jumpy every morning. <laughs> every morning's just another day. A little more muddle, a few more bills. Oh, well, don't worry. It'll all come out in the wash. Yes, perhaps. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. What is it, please? Do you think you could use... Oh, you're uh... selling something. No, not today. I'm sorry. Oh. Well, then do you mind if I stay here on your step for a while? Out of the wind? Stay on the steps? Why, no. Oh, come in. It's warm in here. Thank you. I've got the oven on. Nasty weather. Real winter. What are you selling? Apple peelers. Uh, how much? Twenty-five cents or less, if that's too much. Well, uh... Will you wait? I'll go and get my purse. Oh, you needn't bother. I didn't mean to trouble you. And I did get some of the numbness out of these hands. No, no, don't go. Who is it? What, your... Oh, well, I don't think I have the cash. How much? Uh, six lamb chops, a dollar thirty-five. Well, I, uh, I haven't that much cash in the house. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Ward, but the boss said cash. All right, if you can't leave them, you can. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Ward. Oh, dear... Everything always seems to happen at once. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> well, there's nothing to laugh at. I often laugh when there's nothing to laugh at. It's a good plan sometimes. I know, but, but we've got to have dinner. You'll manage. How? Anything in the icebox left over? Well, there's just a little bit of cold lamb from Wednesday. Oh, I hate to give them cold meat in this weather. No, they must have something hot. How many are there? Well, there are three of us. My husband, my daughter, and myself. You could make a meat pie out of this. Is there enough? It doesn't have to be all meat. Have you any onions, carrots? Oh, yes, yes, we have those. Oh, won't you take off that wet coat? I will, if you'll let me help you make a meat pie. Well, that would be very kind. It was very kind of you to let me come into your warm kitchen. Would you like a cup of hot coffee? Thank you. I'll get it for you. Oh, no, please. You sit down. You look tired. Yes, I am a little. Ah, oh, it's funny, isn't it? What? Well, just a few minutes ago, I felt very low and, and a bit lonely. And now? And now, I'm glad you blew in. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> Marcia, who's that woman in the kitchen? Shh, her name's Hannah. Hannah? Hannah who? Well, I haven't got that far. She made the pie. But I don't just... Here she comes. There's more vegetables if you want. Oh, thank you, Hannah. Well, Sally, how was school today? Oh, all right. Oh, uh, Mrs. Uh, 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 Hannah, 
My wife tells me you made this pie. Yes, I did. Well, may I say it's delicious? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Say, Daddy, I have a bone to pick with you. You've been jumping on Peter Trimble in class again. Well, what's the matter, Hannah? Nothing. I... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's all right, Hannah. It didn't break. Excuse me. Uh, Marsha, she's not staying, is she, uh, Hannah? No, but I wish she were. It was the strangest thing, Paul. I was in the kitchen this morning going over those bills, and I never felt lower in all my life. Then she came in, and in a few minutes I felt I'd known her all my life. The next thing I knew, I had a rest. Sally had set the table, and here we all are. I just can't understand it. Sally is setting the table? No, I can't either. <laughs> oh, Daddy, you're mean. I'm going to help Hannah wash the dishes, too, and nobody even asked me. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. That's what it is. Santa, it was such fun you doing that, coming in that way and announcing dinner. I'm glad it worked. Oh, did you see Daddy's face? Hannah, you sounded keen. Sally, who was that boy, you know, the one you said your father was picking on? Oh, Peter Trimble. Yes. Oh, he's awfully nice. Your father doesn't seem to think so. Oh, Dad just thinks Peter's spoiled because his father lets him have too much money. Does he? You can choke a cat to death with too much cream. What do you mean by that? Too much kindness. Ever since Peter's mother died, I feel sort of sorry for him, even if he does have money. Because, well, a boy needs a woman to, to sort of bring out the nicer things in him. Don't you think so, Hannah? I think you're a very wise little girl, Sally. Yes, boys do. What do you folks have for breakfast? Oh, just the usual stuff, cereal, eggs, toast. Why do you ask? I just thought maybe I'd have time to fix breakfast for you in the morning before I leave. I thought you'd gone. Yes, to market. They had a lot of specials in this morning's paper, so I thought I'd get an early start before they were all snapped up. Twelve cans of corn, twelve cans of tomatoes, Hannah, and but... I got a hogshead. There's a lot of meat on it, and very tasty if you know how to make it up. Sausage, scratch pull, mincemeat. Why, Hannah, now listen to me. Mr. Ward and I are very grateful to you for helping us, but you must understand that we cannot afford a servant. Suppose I don't want any wages. Oh, no, we couldn't have you without. How much do you think it costs you a month for food? Oh, about $70, maybe 80 some month. Give me 60 and I'll feed you and pay myself fair wages. Why are you so anxious to stay here, Hannah? Oh, I like it here, and I think you need me. Hannah, have you got some special kind of religion? I don't know that you'd call it that. Why? Why do you seem to like helping people, even strangers? No one's a stranger. Maybe I'm too dumb to explain, but all I know is this. We're all related so closely that if you make war on other people, you're only fighting yourself. And if you don't trust others, you're not trusting yourself. Oh, you'll be fooled now and then and defrauded. But if you walk quietly and trustfully, you'll always have something to show for it. You mean spiritual satisfaction. Oh, that's old stuff. We used to sing about it in Sunday school. Not by a jugful, you didn't. This thing I'm talking about isn't easy to do. You make a resolution... That when people revile you and persecute you and defraud you, you'll simply smile back and take it on the chin and make that the fixed rule of your life and refuse to quarrel or fight no matter what they do to you. And you'll soon discover that you've tackled something with more teeth in it than any Sunday school ditty. Anna, you believe that, don't you? I not only believe it, I do it. It's my life. Marsha, that you in the cellar? No, Mr. Ward, it's me. Oh, Hannah, what are you doing with those old dishes? I'm just getting them stacked up for Mr. Sloan, along with the rest of the furniture we sold him. Sloan? What's that cutthroat furniture dealer been doing around here? Why, well, Mr. Sloan's not a cutthroat, if you know how to manage him. He gave me $49.50 for the second-hand stuff you had down there when I threw in the dishes. You mean you sold this old junk? Well, I figured Mrs. Ward could use the money. Oh, it's not fit for kindling. Say, what's all this? Oh, that. I just rigged up a little laboratory down here for you. My own laboratory? Do my eyes deceive me? Am I observing one who does not laugh at the possibility of an invention from me? You get good light here. You're near the furnace. That'll keep you warm. 
Oh, thank you, Hannah. The only thing I couldn't fix was that leak up there in the ceiling. Yes, I know. It's from the old drip pan under the icebox. I talked to Plummer, but he wanted $30 to fix it. $30? What for? Well, I had the brilliant idea we could tap that water off into a pipe and down into the drain. Well, I should think the best way to do would be to do something about that old drip pan. Silly thing. Well, we do do something about it. We empty it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. What's really needed is an ice box without a drip pen. Well, that means an ice box without ice. That's a contradiction in terms. I don't see how uh, an iceless ice box. Well, you have a horseless carriage. There must be some chemicals or something that could make things cold. Well, you can freeze things by compressed air or ammonia, but how could you get it into an ice box? Maybe you could. Yeah, maybe you could. Yes, you can make a cold storage plant in miniature. Your ice box is a cold chamber, and you connect your miniature refrigerating plant by tubing, and... Well, wouldn't it... Wouldn't it be marvelous? Wouldn't it? I'm frightened. What of? Uh, another disappointment. Disappointments are bad things, that is, of course, unless you make use of them. Make use of a disappointment? Well, I don't see well, how... you know, sometimes a disappointment closes a door in a person's face, and then he looks about for some other door, opens it, and get something better than he'd been hunting for in the first place. Don't forget, they do say victory. Real victory is built on defeats. Anna, well, what is it about you? Something in the way you speak, and the way you look. Something that gives courage. You can't draw courage from someone else. It's in yourself, deep down inside. But you must trust yourself and have faith. Don't let fear stop you or ridicule or poverty because you're stronger than those things. You have a mind and a heart and a will to do. Yeah, I want to start right now on this idea. I'll leave you alone then. Good night, Mr. Ward. Good night, Hannah. Curtain falls on the first act of White Banners, starring Faye Bainter, Lewis Stone, and Jackie Cooper. And now, during our brief intermission, let's listen in on the young Joneses. They haven't been married very long, and tonight they're stepping out. All ready now, Tommy. Goodness, what made you think of that old one? Stay as sweet as you are. Remember it? Of course <laughs> I remember it. I was just wondering what made you think of it, that's all. How do I look? Well, if you must know, Mrs. Jones... You made me think of it. Oh, why, Tommy, you're getting sentimental. <laughs> sure, I'm sentimental. But uh, before we start on this party, we're going to have a little dance. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea, Tommy. Oh, no fooling, Sue. What makes you so nice, so sweet all the time? When a woman is fresh and sweet from head to toe, a man notices. He probably doesn't stop to think of her as dainty. He just knows she's nice to be close to, sweet. Now, here's a wonderful way to make sure of this charm that women everywhere are adopting. A daily Lux Toilet Soap Beauty Bath. The active lather of this fine white soap leaves skin absolutely fresh and fragrant, too, with a delicate perfume that clings. It takes just a few moments for this luxurious bath, but you step out refreshed, sure of daintiness, sure of skin that's sweet. Make Lux Toilet Soap your daily beauty bath. Here's Mr. DeMille. Act two of White Banners, starring Faye Bainter as Hannah, Lewis Stone as Paul Ward, and Jackie Cooper as Peter Trimble. A few days have passed since Hannah came out of the storm and into the ward's life. A new peace has settled over the house since her arrival. But for all her love and gentleness, there's something mysterious about Hannah... Something having to do with Peter Trimble, one of Mr. Ward's pupils. Peter is a problem, but Hannah has persuaded the teacher to make the boy his friend instead of punishing him as he'd planned. It's evening, and in the basement laboratory, Peter stands twisting his hat in his hands. Mr. Ward looks up from his work and sees him. Ah, oh, good evening, Trimble. Good evening, sir. You don't like this idea of giving up your evenings, do you, Peter? Well, what did you want me to do, sir? <laughs> Before I tell you, suppose we drop this classroom attitude. If we're going to work together, might as well be friends. 
work together? Well, I thought you might be able to help me in my invention. My asking you here was pure selfishness. My first idea was to give you some extra homework, chemistry problems. And then my Machiavellian mind evolved a brilliant idea. This boy, I said to myself, is really a brilliant chemistry student. Why waste his ability on useless homework? Why not make him help me with my problems? Why not discipline Peter to pay Paul? You're really inventing something. Well, looks like it, doesn't it? Yeah, re- refrigeration. Oh, something like a commercial plant, isn't it? Well, in a way, in a way, Peter, but just imagine. Every home could have it. An ice box without ice, without drip pans and all that mess. Now, we make a miniature plant in the basement, connect it with pipes to the kitchen ice box above, and turn on a switch, and the housewife can have her own cold ice box without ice. Gee, that, that is an idea, isn't Isn't it? it? Peter, do you get a kick out of it? I sure do, sir. Oh, if it works out, we'll have something that every home must have. And fame and fortune will be ours. Well, are we partners? Oh, yes, sir. This is exciting. Well, don't get excited enough to tell anyone. Someone might steal this, and it's got to be kept secret. Oh, you can trust me, Mr. Ward. We are, then, colleagues, scientists working together. Oh, oh yes, sir. Good. Now, uh, suppose we get to work. Just take a look at these plans. You can see... Uh... I'm here, Mrs. Ward, by the cellar stairs. Oh, is that uh, Peter Trimble down there? Yes, it's Peter. Oh, I get it, sure. <laughs> oh, it's nice hearing a boy's laugh in the house, isn't it? Yes, that's just what I was thinking. few minutes longer. I think you should be in bed, Sally, with that cold. I know, but just till Daddy and Peter get through down there, I've got to see Peter about something. Again, that makes every night for over a month that you've had something very important to talk over with Peter. Yes, but, oh, Hannah, you know. <laughs> yes, I know. Yippee! We got it! We got it! We got What's it! What's that? Marsha, Sally, Hannah, come down here. Hannah, come on. Look, ice, ice, isn't it swell ice? Paul, Paul, what is it? Look, Marsha, look. What's going on? Now, stay back up there, Sally. You're getting a cold. Oh, now, don't keep the child shut away while history's being made. We've done it, Marsha, Peter and I. We'll be famous. What did you do, Daddy? <laughs> we did it. Can't you all talk a little lower? After all, it's the middle of the night. Don't mind it, Mrs. Ward. It's his victory. Let him shout it from the housetops. Let him tell the world. Now, Hannah's right. I want to shout about it. Look, look, just, just just touch those coils. Touch them. Oh, they're cold. Well, there's frost on them. Yeah. Ice. That's beautiful ice. Don't you realize it? The iceless ice box of Peter and Paul works. It actually works. Oh, Daddy. Peter, oh, aren't you thrilled, Peter? Yeah, I guess I am, all right. Peter's too tired right now, to be sure. Ah, yeah, poor kid. Hannah's right. He's asleep on his feet. Go home and get some sleep, Peter. But don't forget, son, we're partners. And tomorrow you can tell your father we're ready to apply for the patent. And if he is willing to back us... Oh, Dad says he'll see us through this all the way. Oh, gosh, I I guess I am tired. Good night, Sally. Good night, all. Good night. Good night, Peter. I'm proud of you. Thank you, Hannah. Good night. Is it... Is it really true, Paul? Your invention's successful this time? Yes, Marsh, it's true. Your husband's rich, famous, successful... And you, the pampered, spoiled bride of wealth. No more bills, no more scrimping, no more teaching school for me. At last, money. Money to visit all the places we dreamed of. Europe and Egypt. Money, Marsha. I, I'd like a drink. I'll make some cocoa. <laughs> Good old Hannah. We'll drink to our future in cocoa. When she went out, didn't she look swish with that new evening dress? She looked lovely, dear. And wait till Peter sees my new coat and my new skates. Hannah, Hannah, do you like my hair out or, or up or under this hat? I'd like to see you up in bed with a nice hot drink. That's what I'd like oh, to see. Oh, Hannah, stop. You didn't notice my coat, did you? It's beautiful, Sally. But you'll get hot skating and the wind's keen out there on the lake. Have Peter stay oh, in. didn't you know he was racing for the cup? Don't be silly, Hannah. Oh, there's Peter now. I'll go fix my hair. Hello, Hannah. She ready? Peter, do me a favor. Shoot. Try and talk Sally out of going out tonight. Oh, why? Well, she's got a cold, and it's getting down on her chest. Oh, fresh air will do her good. No, it won't. Be a man. Help me out. I don't want to spoil her fun, but... (coughs) There, listen to her cough. I'm not going to let her go. Oh, if I know Sally, you won't stop her. Here I am. Well, come on. Step on it, will you? I want to get some practice, and... Don't go, Sally, please. I'm going to insist. 
Insist? Your mother's not home, and... Well, I really insist. Well, who do you think you are, anyway? Well, I'm a woman, and I... Well, all the same, you're just a servant here. Come on, Sally. Don't worry, Hannah. A servant. Oh, Peter... Is the house, mister? Yeah, yeah. Well, here you are, driver. And keep the change. Thank you, sir. Oh, wasn't it luxurious, Paul, riding in a cab? I've got such a comfortable feeling. <laughs> That's the champagne. <laughs> There's a light on, Paul. Hannah must be waiting up for it. Mrs. Ward, I've been waiting up. Ah, good old Hannah welcoming the prodigals. Hannah? Mrs. Ward and I have been out spending our royalties in advance. I got the hot water bottles, Hannah. Uh, oh. My partner. Well, what are you doing here at this hour, Peter? Hot water bottles. Hannah, what's happened? Sally? Sally's all right. She's in bed, that's all. In bed? Well, what happened? Sally went through the ice. It was oh. all my fault. I, Sally! I... Sally! Oh, Paul, come with me. Oh, uh, don't worry, Marcia. Don't worry. Hannah. Yes, Peter? If she gets sick, they'll blame me. And they're right. It was my fault. No, Peter, it wasn't anyone's fault. Oh, Hannah, I was awful fresh with you when you didn't want her to go. I'm sorry. Oh, Peter. Is the doctor still up there, Mr. Ward? Yeah, yeah. Gee, this, this waiting around... Oh, it's awful. Well, cheer up, Peter. The doctor's been pretty encouraging. Hello. Oh, hello, Miss Trimble. Yeah, yes, he's here. Oh, he's fine. What? Oh, they're dead. From Washington. Well, well that's impossible. They couldn't. The Ellis brothers? Oh, uh, yes, they made some parts for us, but they never saw the drawings or the model, no. Oh, uh, all right, I'll see you in the morning. Well, Peter. Yes, sir? The bad news. Yes, sir? Yes. The Ellis brothers filed a patent application a week ago. Same model, same principle. They, they did? Yes, they did. Well, we're done for, my boy. How? Oh, how could they have done it? Now, let's, let's just think back. They never saw anything assembled, no drawings. We call for the parts ourselves. Oh, w- wait a minute. You remember the last day, the day we finished? Joe Ellis came, but he didn't go down into the cellar. I wasn't here. You said you met him at the back door, didn't you? Didn't you? Yes. Ah, I'm, I'm, I'm not accusing you, Peter. But all those Ellis brothers needed was one look at our model to get onto our idea. They're expert mechanics. But how, how could they have seen it? I don't know. Why do you keep asking me for it? Never mind, never mind. Have a cigarette, Peter. Well, what? I said to have a cigarette. Oh, I don't. don't. But you you smoke, don't you? (laughs) Don't you? You were smoking the day we finished our work, remember, in the cellar? I came back from your father's office and I found a cigarette lying beside the model... You said it was your cigarette? Well, was it yours or was it Joe Ellis's? I asked you then if it was Joe Ellis's, but you said no. You said you tried smoking because you were tired and nervous. You lied, didn't you, Peter? You're a liar, aren't you? Oh, it wasn't my fault. He came down by himself. I tried to stop him. I tried to get him out. I couldn't. If you hadn't been a liar, Peter, if you'd have told the truth, I could have rushed an application to Washington ahead of the Ellis's. I could have sent it out that same day before they could draw up any plans, couldn't I? Yes, yes. My partner. My colleague. Uh, go on. Mr. Get out. Mr. Ward. You're young. Your father's rich. This won't hurt you. But you have to live with yourself. And you're a liar and a fool. Mr. Ward, let go of me. And I'll tell you another thing. I think you've told him enough. I've told him the truth. Do you know what he... I heard. You'd better leave, Peter. All right. Ah, you're pretty calm about it. Why shouldn't you be? You're a stranger. You aren't one of us. Why shouldn't you be calm? But I'm going to fight. Nobody's going to rob me of my one chance of a life. 
I'll fight to my last breath, my last nickel, and what's more, I'll win. Win? You don't think I will, do you? You don't think I've got a fighting chance, do you? I don't think you have a chance fighting. Well, I'll fight anyway. The doctor just left. You mean Sally's... It's the crisis. And you can't fight that either. You've got to wait. Well, that's all I've been doing is waiting. All my life. I can go on, I guess. But I won't need this. Stop it! Stop it! Oh, no, I know your work! Oh, now look what you've done. Oh, you've cut your hand. Ah. Stand still. Let me dress it. You know, a long time ago, before we were really civilized, people used to have their lands and their herds taken away from them. But instead of fighting... They went on to a new country and made themselves great. Of course, maybe they did feel badly, but they soon found out it was no use to argue which was to blame for the spilt milk. All that does matter is to wipe up the mess, and the strong ones do the wiping up. Oh, Hannah, don't you ever stop talking. Not so long as I've something to say. Well, you can save your breath. I know what you're driving at. Your pet theory that asks for a second slap in the face that says you've stolen my coat, take my overcoat, too... Well, you don't have to keep harping on it. If Sally gets well, I won't fight the Ellis brothers. Oh, no. No, 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 you mustn't say that. Please, don't say that again. We might lose Sally. You can't make bargains with God. When you make a sacrifice, you've got to go the whole hog. You mean promise not to fight whether Sally gets well or not? Well, you must be out of your mind. I'm a bigger fool listening to you. You and your theories. What have they done for you? Where have you ended up? In my kitchen, meddling in my business. Well, you've meddled enough. Now, get out. Get out, I tell you. Well, aren't you going? No. Have you any pride? Not that kind. This is my house, and I am asking you to leave it. I won't go. Not as long as you need me. And you do. Well, you win. I'll surrender to the Ellis brothers. Hoist the white flag. Not white flags. White banners. You're not surrendering. You're just taking up a new position, and with it, you're taking a new strength. I I think you're crazy. I can't explain it properly. I'm too dumb. But I've learned that when you give up something or someone you want badly, something you're really entitled to, you gain a sort of strange power, which is worth more than the thing you gave up. You honestly believe in all this, Hannah, don't you? Yes. I wish I could. That's not what matters. Some belief is cheap and doesn't cost you anything. But you're pledging yourself to something that's apt to cost you everything. Sally may be saved, but you mustn't count on that. You've got to keep right on trusting no matter what happens. Oh, oh. Uh, Marsha, what, what is it? It's, it's Sally. What? Marsha, is she... Oh, poor, poor, come quick. <laughs> for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Before our stars bring us Act Three of White Banners, we'll have a short intermission during which we'll hear from the evening special guest. But first, here's a suggestion about the product behind the Lux Radio Theater. Nothing means more to a woman than the smooth, natural beauty of her complexion. Nothing is more important than to keep that beauty. And so it's foolish, very foolish, to be careless about cosmetic skin. So often, without being at all conscious of it, a woman fails to to take proper care of her skin, actually fails to clean it properly. Then, when pores become choked, cosmetic skin may develop dullness, little blemishes, enlarged pores. Nine out of ten screen stars use Lux Toilet Soap. Its active lather does a thorough job of removing stale cosmetics, dust, and dirt. Use cosmetics all you like, but make this fine white soap nine out of ten screen stars use your daily beauty care. Mr. DeMille. I suppose almost everyone, at one time or another, has had a bright idea which caused people to ask them, why don't you get it patented? Our guest tonight is the man best qualified in all the United States...
to tell you whether your million-dollar idea is really something new under the sun. Conway P. Coe is United States Commissioner of Patents, head of the government's patent office. And it's a pleasure to take you to Washington, D.C. to meet Commissioner Coe. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. I'm glad to meet your audience and tell them that the disappointment and grief of Professor Ward, Peter, and Hannah were due to their belief that all was lost to them because the Ellis brothers had already applied for a patent. It was their unfamiliarity with our patent system that caused all the trouble. If the professor had only filed an application after discovering the treachery of the Ellis brothers, the machinery of the patent office would have begun to function. Both he and the Ellis brothers would have been asked to explain the origin of the invention, and under the circumstances revealed in the play, he would have triumphed and the imposters might have been punished under the criminal laws for falsely swearing that they were the originators of the idea. In the United States, a patent is granted to the first inventor, and not, as in many foreign countries, to the first to file an application. So then, had Hannah, the professor, and Peter been more open about their invention, they would have been saved their heartaches. Maybe you don't know it, but the very word patent itself comes from the Latin meaning open. While it is true a patent reveals an invention, it also protects the inventor. A secret invention, on the contrary, is without the protection which its disclosure in accordance with the law would give it. A hundred and fifty years ago, before the patent office existed, an inventor had to work in secret for his own protection. But now secrecy is wholly unnecessary and, as the play reveals, may be ruinous to the creator. Americans can take pride in the fact that their patent office is the best in the world. We encourage our people to apply for patents covering their inventions, and enough of them do to require a staff of more than 1,300 trained employees to pass upon the patentability of new ideas. If inventors would only take the precaution to apply for and obtain letters patents on their creations, the law would protect them. The struggles of Peter and the professor raise the interesting question whether it is possible today for an individual of small means to develop a practical, useful invention which promises financial reward. Can such such an individual hope to compete with the trained engineers employed in the laboratories of the great corporations who provide endless resources and the most modern laboratory equipment for research? The facts clearly indicate that the day of the individual inventor has not vanished and that he repeatedly comes forth with valuable ideas which contribute to our comfort and to the scientific progress. Men and women in the strata and circumstances of the characters in your play are still assisting in the solution of many vital problems and contributing to the greatness of our nation. Right now, though, I want to hear what the professor and Peter will do next. They are working to better the lives of that huge public we all serve, whether by inventing, as they do, protecting new creations, as the patent office does, or by presenting excellent entertainment, Mr. DeMille, as you do. Thank you, Commissioner. You'll hear from us just as soon as we build that better mousetrap. In Hollywood again, we continue White Banners, starring Faye Bainter, Louis Stone, and Jackie Cooper. Five o'clock the following morning. Upstairs in her tiny bedroom, Sally fights desperately for life. The morning is biting cold, and on the gray street, a shadow moves slowly back and forth, stopping now and then to gaze up at Sally's window. Hannah comes from the house and calls quietly. Peter? Peter Trimble, is that you? Yes. Yes, it's me. Why, Peter? Oh, I... Just happened to be passing by and saw the doctor's car. I see. I thought I'd wait and ask you. Oh, Sally was? Yes. Is she... Is she all right? We're hoping she is. You'd better come inside. No, I'd rather stay out here. Isn't it too cold? No. You're shivering, Peter. No, I, I don't feel it. Well, men are like that. Strong. Able to stand things. I need to be around someone like that just now. But you... You aren't ever frightened of anything, are you? Oh, I've been afraid of most everything one time or another. 
You see, women are naturally weak and timid, easily led, especially by someone they look up to. That's why men have to be brave and strong to protect them. And a man can be gentle, too, without losing any of his manliness. Did you ever stop to think what the word gentleman means? It means a gentleman. A man who thinks of others before himself. As you're doing now. Thinking of us and our trouble. Anna. The light's gone out up there. She's past the crisis. You mean she's out of danger? Yes. Whatever's happened, she's out of danger. Here's the doctor. He'll tell us. Dr. Thompson. Oh, you still up, Hannah? Sally, is She's she... She's going to be all right. Now, you go to bed and get some sleep. Nearly daylight. She's going to be all right. She's going to be all right. Yes, Peter. And you can cry now if you want to. Oh, Hannah. Hannah. The contents will be as good as new. I'll send them all up on the train tomorrow, eh, Hannah? That's all she needs. Oh, by the way, Peter Trimble is here. Oh, yeah? He wants to see you. What about? He has an idea of something he's worked out on new lines. Not another refrigerator. I'm afraid so. I'm not interested. I don't want to hear anything more about refrigerator. Well, it's really only half an idea. He's stuck, and we thought perhaps if you could help him... I'm sorry, no. Well, don't you think as a pupil he has a right to go to his teacher for help? You're not still... Well, it would be nice if you could speak to him. Uh, all right, I'll speak to him. Come in, Peter. Oh, hello. Hello, Mr. Ward. Hello, Peter. Sit down. I'll go and see about Sally's medicine. Something on your mind? Well, well sir, I, I did have sort of a crazy idea, Mr. Ward... I got it from watching a coffee percolator. Uh, you inventing a coffee percolator? Oh, no, sir. Another kind of icebox without machinery. Without machinery? Aren't you getting a little mixed up, Peter? I hope not, sir. Look, Mr. Ward, here is a cross-section of a coffee percolator. Uh-huh. Now, the tube of the coffee container runs down into the water here. Now, what happens when Hannah lights the gas under the percolator? Now, that's a simple problem in physics, Peter. The heat vaporizes the water in the tube here, causing it to become lighter than the water surrounding it and forcing off the tube into the coffee. Yes, it's like a pump, Mr. Ward. A pump without gears or pistons. Why couldn't we do the same thing in an icebox? What do you mean? Use a pump of nature instead of a man-made mechanical pump made cold with heat? Well, Peter, that's marvelous. It's never been done before. But it can be. I'm sure it can be. <laughs> we'll make those Ellis brothers look like monkeys. Yes, sir. That was the idea. Good boy, Peter. Straight wire to Mr. Sam Trimble, Congress Hotel, Chicago, Illinois. Model of new gas icebox completed. Could come to Chicago to demonstrate to Bradford, or is there a chance of bringing him here? Advise at once. Regards, Paul Ward. Hello. Hello. Yes, yes, this is Ward speaking. Mr. Trimble? Why, hello. You calling from Chicago? You here? When did you get in? Oh, Peter's fine. Yeah, just put him to bed. Poor kid's all fagged out. Been working like a Trojan. What's that? Bradford. Not the Thomas J. Bradford. Why, that's marvelous. Now... Certainly, if you think it's all right, bring him over. Hannah. Hannah. Yes, Mr. Ward? Hannah, it's happened. Trimble's back and he's got Bradford with him. Thomas J. Bradford. And he insists on seeing our icebox immediately. They're on their way here now. Bradford coming here? Yes. Yeah, well, well, what's the matter? He mustn't come here. Well, Hannah? He mustn't see Peter. What? It wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be fair. I won't let you, Mr. Ward. I uh, won't. Hannah, what are you talking about? Uh, you're in trouble? What is it? You asked me once if I'd ever had a child. I had. It's the oldest story in the world. The child's father was the son of the rich lady who employed me. I fell in love with him. We married secretly, and then his mother sent him away, around the world. I tried writing to him, hoping that if he knew, but he never got the letters. They always came back. 
His name was Bradford. Bradford? I went to his mother, naturally. It was no use. So my baby was born in a charity ward. I lay there wondering. Wondering what would happen to him. What I could do. And then the doctor came and said that a lady in the private pavilion had had a baby too. That day, but... It had died. The woman wasn't young. It was her first baby. And they were afraid the shock would be too much. Could they take my baby boy and put him in her arms and let her believe it was her own baby? I knew if the lady and her husband were good people, that it was the right thing to do. And it turned out that they were. Mrs. Trimble was a very fine woman. Mrs. Trimble? Not Peter. Yes. Peter Trimble is my boy. But his mother never knew, and he mustn't know. That's why Bradford must never see him. But they're, they're, they're here now. Mr. Ward, Peter must remain as he is. Do you understand? We mustn't wake him. Go down there, show them the icebox. Tell them, well, tell them that Peter's asleep. Tell them anything. Hey, Mr. Ward. Uh, uh, Peter. D- didn't I hear the bell? Uh, yes. Well, aren't you going to open the door? Uh, yes, Peter. Come along. See, we only got it finished tonight, Mr. Bradford. Been having some trouble with the valves. Did you fix it? Oh, sure. Run smooth as silk now, Mr. Bradford. Doesn't it, Mr. Ward? Uh-huh. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Now, uh, here are the plans, Mr. Bradford. I, uh, I wondered if you would excuse me a minute. I, I want to get my pipe. I left it in my coat. Oh, I'll get it. No, sir. please. I, I'll be right back. Hello. I thought you'd want to see me. It's been a long time. Yes, it has, Tom. I knew you right away, as soon as I came tonight. Did you? That's our boy, isn't it, Hannah? Peter is our son. Yes. It was the strangest thing. Trimble himself told me. You see, as long as his wife was alive, they couldn't legally adopt Peter. And he's been worrying ever since his wife died about what would happen to the boy if anything... Well, if he went on. He confided in me and asked me to arrange the details. I thought nothing of it. He's an old friend of mine, and the lawyers were drawing up the papers. Of guardianship? Yes. And when they came to the name of the mother, it was your name. You came to take him? Naturally. You can't. Why not? I have every right. I don't think you have. Oh, I won't try now to explain or apologize. Those were other days. I played hard, and I, I smashed up. I've had everything and nothing. I've been very lonely. And then out of the blue, I suddenly found there was something alive, of flesh and blood that's mine, that I have a boy, a son, and Hannah, he... He's a fine kid. You haven't found the boy. He doesn't know about me. He mustn't know about you. But I need him, Hannah. You can't hate me enough to deny me this one chance of happiness. I don't hate you, Tom, but it's too late. Do you... Do you think we could ever pick up and go on? I... I mean, the three of us? I don't know if I could make up to you for all I've left undone, but I... I would try... And I could give Peter every advantage, money, power, everything. Everything? The everything that destroyed you? Oh, don't you see, Tom? It's no longer a question of you or me. Our duty is to think of him. Could you bring yourself to say to that boy, your name is not Peter Trimble. You haven't a name. The man you love and look up to as your father is not your father. That woman whom you loved as your mother was not your mother. Your real father abandoned you before you were born, and your mother was a servant in the house. You were a nameless child in a charity ward. Could you? No, you couldn't, and you won't do this to him. I warn you, don't try. Uh, Hannah. Oh, Mr. Ward, if you will be kind enough to no, leave this... No, with... please, he's my friend. When I heard you were coming here, I told him everything. I see. Well, then perhaps you'll try to make Hannah see things the way I do, Mr. Ward. And how is that? I want to take Peter. Uh, I want my son. Hannah, you... Do you think it's right? Do you? I don't know. But I do. I won't let him smash Peter like he did himself. I can't. I'll lie. I'll perjure myself. I'll deny that Peter belongs to him. I'll fight him. I'll Anna, fight him. Anna, can you? Honestly? You taught me once not to fight. You gave me a new position, new strength. White banners, you remember. 
Don't you, Hannah? You keep out of this. You're only an outsider. I told you that once, too, Hannah. But it isn't your child that's in danger. It's mine. Sally was in danger. You told me I wouldn't stand a chance fighting. Now, Hannah, don't do this to yourself. Your faith's in danger. The faith you've built up in all of us. Are you going to let it die? All right. I won't fight. Do you want to see him now, Tom? I... Yes. Peter? Peter, come in here. Oh, just a minute. Yes, Hannah? Peter, Mr. Bradford has something to say to you. Oh, I thought you were coming in to see the icebox. What's the matter, Mr. Ward? Is anything wrong? Uh, no, no. Well, don't you want to see the icebox, Mr. Bradford? Oh, yes, of course, Peter. Well, then, uh, shall we go? Come here, son. Yes, sir? Peter, I... I want to tell you why... Yes, sir? I... I think your invention will be a great success. The plans look good, and you and Mr. Ward will probably make a good bit of money. I'll see that your interests are protected. Now I've got to go. Uh, I'll send a contract from Chicago. A, a contract? You mean you're leaving now? Yes. Good night. Well, g- good night, Mr. Bradford. Thanks. It's all right, Peter. Night. I'll let you out, Mr. Bradford. He didn't tell him. He didn't tell him. No, and he won't now. You've won, Hannah. Another victory built on defeat. enough tonight, Hannah. Why don't you go to bed? I will. I'm tired, Mr. Ward. I want to thank you for all you've done. Thank me? I'm the one that's eternally in your debt. I can't stay here anymore, Mr. Ward. I'm leaving. Leaving? Why, you can't mean that, Hannah. Well, this is your home. You're one of the family. My job is done here, Mr. Ward. I've got to go. Peter's on his way. I have a loyal friend who will look after him. Well, surely you can stay no, here and... No, no. You'll never know. Perhaps you had a taste of it when you thought you were going to lose Sally. There's no creed. No faith on earth can deal with the agony of not being able to go upstairs and tell that boy that he's mine. That I love him. We all love you, Hannah. We'll always be here. Will you ever come back? I don't know. You're kind, Mr. Ward. Very kind. Good night. Good night, Hannah. In the morning, I'll take you wherever you're going. Peter, are you asleep? Not that. Oh, come in, Hannah. I'm glad you came, Hannah. Sit down here. There's something I want to say to you. Yes? You know, I was I was just thinking that I owe you a lot. I never did get to thank you for all you've done for me. You know, that, that time with Sally and then with the icebox. You kind of like going around helping people. I like helping you, Peter. Thanks. Hannah, would you think I'm a sissy if I told you something? Of course not. Well, you're you're sitting here like this reminded me. What is it, Peter? Well, I'd I'd no sooner get into bed and my mother would come in just like you did. She'd sit right down here alongside of me and she'd rumple my hair and she'd tuck me into bed. Like this, Peter? (laughs) Yeah. And then what would your mother do? Oh, she she kissed me goodnight. May I kiss you goodnight, Peter? Oh, would you? Oh, you're a peach, Anna. Good night, Peter. Happy dreams. God bless you. Good night. See you in the morning. Miss Hannah. 
Hannah. Oh, good morning. How much milk today, Miss Hannah? Oh, the usual, I think. Oh, mighty cold this morning. Going someplace? Yes. Toward the station. I'll give you a lift if you can wait. No, thanks. I'll walk. Goodbye. But you'll be blown to bits if Goodbye. you... Goodbye. Goodbye. Hmm. Wonder where she's going on a day like this. We've just left Hannah leaving Middale. But we won't let Faye Bainter leave our stage until she joins Lewis Stone and Jackie Cooper and answers a couple of questions. I want to find out what they think of plays like White Banners, plays with a message. Miss Bainter. Well, if they can all be like White Banners, Mr. DeMille, I'm tremendously in favor of them. What do you think, Lewis? Well, the play's first purpose is to entertain. But a great play, I think, is one that combines entertainment with a lesson. The man who wrote tonight's story, Lloyd Douglas... Has that happy faculty, and we need more teachers like Dr. Douglas. Let's hear from the high school division. Jackie, what is it we want? Entertainment with a message, or just plain entertainment? Well, sir, I've never heard much talk about that particular point around Beverly High, but I can tell you that in high school, we have opinions now on almost everything from football to politics. It might even be that we're beginning to think. <laughs> but we can still tell you the most popular dance tunes of the week. <laughs> I'm sure of it. With you beating the drum and leading a dance orchestra and Mickey Rooney writing songs. Oh, yes, my errant son, Andy Hardy. <laughs> I expect we'll find ourselves in a picture called the Hardys and Tin Pan Alley sometime soon. Well, it's a very good idea. But mentioning Tin Pan Alley makes me homesick because that reminds me of New York and New York reminds me of the Hudson River and the Hudson River of my farm. I just spent a week there on my way back to Hollywood from Europe. Really forgetting that I'm an actress. Hollywood never <laughs> let you forget that for long, Faye. Thanks. Well, there's one thing I never forget, Mr. DeMille. Twelve months a year, an actress must remember her complexion. I remember it in the best way I know, and that's the regular use of Lux Toilet Soap as a complexion care. I've used it for years, on the farm when I'm vacationing, and in California when I'm working. And speaking of vacations, what do you do in your time off, Lewis? Oh, I make another hardy picture and do a little horseback riding now and then. I can't ever forget I was once in the cavalry... Well, you know, I was once on a horse and had a little trouble forgetting it, too. <laughs> well, good night, folks. Good night, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> good night. I'll fly your banners from our flag staff any time. An announcement you'll all welcome about our program next week will be given shortly by Mr. DeMille. Fay Bainter appears next in the Warner Brothers picture, Daughters Courageous. And Lewis Stone, who appeared through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, stars soon for them in Andy Hardy Gets Spring Fever. Lewis Silvers is from 20th Century Fox Studios where he directed music for Susanna of the Mounties. Be sure to listen to the Lux Daytime Radio program, The Life and Love of Dr. Searson. The makers of Lux Toilets will bring you this enthralling story about the love and problems of a young, attractive woman doctor every afternoon, Monday through Friday. Look in your newspapers for the time and station. The Life and Love of Dr. Susan comes to you in addition to the Lux Radio Theater. Mr. DeMille, since a chill on these warm spring nights might prove very welcome, we've selected for your entertainment next Monday night the loudly applauded mystery play, The Ex-Mrs. Bradford, whose thrilling puzzles will be presented and solved by two of the screen's most polished performers, William Powell and Claudette Colbert. Our play concerns a quiet, well-behaved physician and his wife, whose unbridled propensity for imagining murders reaches a climax when she makes one right guess. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents William Powell and Claudette Colbert in The Ex-Mrs. Bradford. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. The cast of White Banners included Betty Jean Haney as Sally Ward, Elizabeth Wilbur as Marsha Ward, Richard Legrand as Bradford. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>